consciousness returned slowly, the drugs leaving Lorcan's system to find he was moving slowly down, the walls around him made of metal, an elevator. He breathed in deeply. There were those who spoke of it, the sarcophagus, but no one knew the truth. It seemed as though anyone who walked in never returned. None were missed. He wouldn't be either. The choices he made no longer making him seem human to most others. The end of his life something they wouldn't be saddened by. Not even his mother would cry. Lorcan stared at the door. Escaping the elevator was an impossibility, but there may be other chances. Whatever the others said might be nothing more than stories, to spread fear into those who were chosen, the way he'd been. It was his time to be useful. At least that was what they said, so it was likely he'd be given some kind of job to do. Finally, his consciousness fully his once more. The elevator reached the right stop, and the door opened automatically. Outside were guards. Each held a firearm, pointed directly at Lorcan, something he'd become used to. Stepping out, knowing it was what he was supposed to do, he looked at each of them in turn, before the sound of footsteps started to come from in front of him. At the same time, the elevator started to move back up. Glancing back, no sign of an easy route to follow the elevator. Lorcan waited, the footsteps likely belonging to the person who'd explain it all to him. When they stepped into the light, a young woman who looked as though she was barely out of college, he raised an eyebrow. She didn't seem to pay any attention to his reaction. Lorcan O'Connell. Who else was it going to be? Nodding, not wanting to anger her on the first day, he studied her. You have been brought to the sarcophagus to assist us in our research. She gestured for him to follow her, as though he had any other choice. The guards gently urging him in that direction. This facility is somewhere you will not be able to escape. Your escapades are well known to us, Mr. O'Connell. Saying nothing, certain he wasn't meant to, Lorcan kept his eyes on where they were going. The guards were watching him closely, but if he was there to assist with some kind of research, it was likely he'd be dealing with scientists. All it took was for one of them to make a mistake. You, of course, don't believe me, but you may when I explain more about the work you are to be doing. She glanced back. There have been those who thought they may be able to use me as their route out. It didn't work out for them, and it won't work out for you. There was a certainty in her voice Lorcan had never heard before. Whatever you may imagine, I was chosen for a reason. Yes, I am young. However, my father has been working on learning more for many years now and he is no longer able to deal with the depth. We are deep under the sea. He stared at her back. This is the deepest I believe any humans have ever been. During one of my father's journeys down here, he found something. Sadly, due to a lack of understanding of what it was, both his companions died, and it was then he started to understand there was so much more to it than he could have imagined. Now, after many years of studying, we understand better. At some point in our distant past, someone or something built something down here. Father believes it may be some kind of temple, connected to an old god, but so far the only thing we are certain of is that we haven't yet explored everything. It's below us, deeper than we are. And you're our next explorer. You'll be going into the ruins. There will be no lights. One of the strangest things about the ruins is light sources of all kinds are useless. In the early days, we tried them all, attempting to find a solution to the problem. Back when Father first found it, they used ropes, believing it would be enough, and finding it wasn't the case. Before you're sent in, you'll be given a suit, which uses sound waves in order for you to navigate, similar to a bat. We know these work, although so far we haven't had anyone return to us. We simply have an expanded map with another disappearance to add to the list. You may be an exception to the rule, Mr. O'Connell. That seemed unlikely. Was he permitted to ask questions? Lorcan raked a hand through his hair, eyes still on the back of the woman leading him through the facility. Someone who'd never given him a name. What did it matter, when it was obvious he was going to be lost within the ruins like all the others? How many had there been? Through the years, so it got to the point where everyone knew about it. So far, you've been very quiet. It's not unusual. Finding out where you are often has that effect on people. But I am willing to answer any questions you may have at this point, if I have the answers to give you. Does anything actually matter? Lorcan shook his head when she glanced back at him, her eyes emotionless. 
You can answer my questions, but I'm going to walk into that ruin alone, knowing I'm never going to return. Anything you tell me right now means nothing. Maybe it does. Some have been fascinated by the very idea of the ruin, believing they will be the one to find their way out. You, on the other hand, have gone in the opposite direction, not willing to think it's possible you might be an exception, and therefore, all of this means nothing to you. I have found this has an effect on how much deeper you can get. Those who have seen themselves being different have been lost to us far sooner. Have you never been scared one of us might come back out? Why scared? Mr. O'Connell, if one of you does end up becoming the exception to the rule, it will change everything for us. She stopped, turning to look at me, her eyes on mine. I have no doubt what you think of us and the decisions we've made in order to map these ruins. Had they been anywhere else, I'm certain the government would have closed them up a long time ago. Instead, they keep sending you to us in order to understand more. Understanding is more important than I think you could possibly understand. How were they made? Does this mean there were civilizations who were able to get down this deep in order to build their temples? We know so little, and the very thought of one of you returning is something we haven't dared to have, as there have been hundreds lost. Too many. At times I've argued against this, saying it would be best to stop. Yet there are those who argue we can't. Not until we know what's in there. If it's something dangerous, then we need to find a way to stop it. Although I have no reason to think it's something we could do easily. More than anything, I want someone to be the exception. To find their way back to tell us what they've found. But every time it doesn't happen, my belief it can die a little more. One day, I have to believe something will change. And the person we sent into the ruins will come back. If I didn't, I'd not be able to do my job. Something I have to admit I sometimes wish wasn't mine at all. But I am the only person who followed in Father's footsteps. He's unwilling to give up. The same way the government is. Leading to us being... Disposable. We made bad choices in our lives, so it doesn't matter if we don't return. If it was someone else, everything would be different. Yes, it would. And I don't see you as disposable, Mr. O'Connell. I want you to return. She stepped over to a locker, taking out a suit that looked like it might have been based on those divers wore. Please remove your clothes and put on the suit, ready to make your journey into the ruin. Blinking, Lorcan took it. You want me to strip right here? It's nothing we haven't all seen before. Shrugging, certain it didn't matter, he stripped off his prison wear, slowly shimmying into the suit. As he did, she was focused on a screen instead of him, while the guards all had their firearms still pointed at him. There was no way of knowing what he might do, although it wasn't like he'd try taking on multiple guards at the same time, when he did have a chance of finding a way out down there. Maybe that was why no one returned. Pulling the hood over his head, a small headphone slipped into his ear. Let me know if you can hear the voice of the computer. She tapped a couple of points on the screen. Should be coming over to you in a second. Good afternoon, Mr. O'Connell. I can hear it. Nodding, she looked at him one last time. This is where you start. Please continue to follow the path. You'll find a point where the lights stop. When that happens, you've reached the ruins. Breathing in deeply, Lorcan took a moment to work through his emotions, preparing for what leaving probably meant. They didn't push him to move, seeming to understand the situation. Instead, they gave him that time. Maybe she did actually want one of them to return, and saw him as their chance for it to happen. It was impossible to know for certain. Starting down the path in silence, Lorcan didn't look back at any point. All he'd see were those guards, still pointing their firearms at him ready to shoot at any point should it be necessary, and it wasn't. He was willing to do what they wanted him to, however illogical it was for them to keep sending people down into a ruin they knew probably killed anyone who entered it. Reaching the darkness took a few minutes, enough time to put a lot of distance between them and anything that did come out, because if there wasn't something in there, why was no one ever finding their way back, or to somewhere else entirely? Maybe there were, and somewhere within was some kind of teleporter that would take him somewhere else entirely. Lorcan laughed at himself. Grandad was the one who read him stories about other worlds, up until he wasn't there anymore. His death hitting hard. The memories were still painful. He sighed, pushing them back the way he always did. 
Mom was the one who tried to use that as the explanation for how he'd got himself into the position he was, and maybe it did have something to do with it. If it hadn't been so sudden, one moment here and the next gone, it might have been easier. Only death was never easy. Understanding that pain should have been the reason he never forced it on to someone else. Instead, Lorcan found himself in a dark place, wanting everyone to hurt the way he did. Some said everything would have been different had he been in therapy, able to actually talk to someone, working through those emotions. They were probably wrong. Even though it was rare, Lorcan thought it was much more likely there was something wrong inside him. If there wasn't, he might have cared when he killed those people. Grandad was the one person he'd truly cared about in losing him. Well, it was an inevitability. All mortals died. Even he would, potentially in the ruins he had almost reached. It was probably for the best he was there. At least his death would mean something to those who wanted to understand what was there. Reaching the point where all light stopped, Lorcan gave himself another moment, knowing when he stepped into the darkness, everything was going to be different. Finally, after longer than he should have waited, he stepped into the darkness, losing all sight in the second it took. Touching the wall with one hand, Lorcan at least knew he was somewhere. It wasn't all a hoax. He breathed in deeply, slowly running his hand over the cold stone. Walk forward, Mr. O'Connell, until I tell you to turn. Doing as he was told, the easiest task, Lorcan thought of the woman who'd sent him down there, how similar her voice was to that of the computer. Maybe they'd used her to create it, because she had made the decision to take over from her father, so those who started wandering the ruins would at least have some consistency. Left here. Knowing he should do what he was told straight away, Lorcan still reached out with one hand to see if there was a wall on the right. There was. Interesting. Going left, the silence lasting longer than it had before, he found himself wondering how large the ruin was. He didn't have any idea of what it looked like. Maybe he should have asked more questions. Ignoring the fact he was walking into something he knew nothing about was stupid. Right now. Once again, Lorcan reached out for the other wall, realizing there was nothing there. As he turned his arm, brushed against a wall in front of him, so he'd been moments away from walking directly into a wall, something he definitely would have done had he not reacted differently to the voice. You could give me a little more warning. It wasn't going to be able to hear him, probably programmed not to say anything more than it did. Unless you want me to break my nose on a wall. There was no response, exactly what he expected. Lorcan kept walking, not feeling anywhere near close to tired, which might have something to do with the suit. Hopefully there was also something within it that would stop him from becoming hungry or thirsty. Otherwise, there were going to be issues in the future. <sighs> Sighing, Lorcan knew there was nothing else he could do other than think and wait for the suit to tell him where to go again. Thinking meant going over everything he'd done before, a nightly ritual for him most of the time, as he tried to work out whether his life could have ended differently, or if he was always going to be the kind of person who ended up wandering in the darkness as a disposable explorer, chosen by the government to do something they wouldn't let anyone else do. Another right. More prepared than before, Lorcan checked all the walls around him. They were all open, but he needed to go right, however tempting it was to go against the computer. It might be the way he was able to find a route out of the ruins, although if he did, was he going to be able to find a way back to the surface? Being deeper than the sea made it that much more complicated, and was probably the main reason they weren't worried about someone being able to escape if there was a way out. Glancing left, even though he still couldn't see anything, he turned right. Had someone else gone the same way as him in the past, so he was simply following their route, and eventually the time would come when Lorcan would step down a path no one had ever been down before. Not that he would know when it was. The computer might have that knowledge without being able to share it with him. Walking for what felt like longer than before, Lorcan closed his eyes. It wasn't as though it mattered whether they were open or closed. The darkness unlike anything he'd seen before. In some ways, it was easier to be looking at the soft darkness of his own eyelids rather than the hard darkness of the ruins around him. How was it even possible? There was no darkness quite as dark anywhere else, at least not that Lorcan knew of, and it was one of those things he'd learnt about from Grandad. Was it simply his vision, at least when his eyes were open? 
Closed, they couldn't see anything at all. Grandad would have been fascinated by the ruins. He was the kind of person who would have thrown as many people as necessary at the problem in order to learn as much as possible. Now, Lorcan was one of the people helping with that, finding answers to a question that was beyond all human understanding, at least right then. Grandad would have wanted him to volunteer for it, and maybe he had, by following the path he'd found himself on, learning more about a different kind of darkness, the darkness someone could have within their soul. Raking a hand through his hair, Lorcan kept moving. Feeling his hair reminded him he did still exist. He was still a person, walking through a dark ruin, only able to know where he was going thanks to the computer within his suit. Someone might have been able to find their way through a certain distance without help, but why would they try? Obviously, someone had, the first people to find the ruins walking into a darkness they definitely couldn't have understood, because they were explorers. It was what they did. No one sane would make the choice to delve deep into the depths the way they had. How was it even possible? Another of the questions he should have asked before. Left, dear. Going left, not checking the other walls, Lorcan kept walking. What did it matter? He didn't need to know anything. Someone else was going to learn everything he'd found out because they'd chosen him as their next explorer. It wasn't something he'd have ever chosen for himself. But then, his choices hadn't exactly been good ones. Do you remember killing him? The voice was still the same, but thoughtful. Killing who? Your list is long. Why did you do it? How long is a piece of string? Lorcan shrugged. Pain is sometimes stronger than we are. We are? Humans. Mortals. <sighs> he breathed in deeply, half wishing there was someone to look at. Who are you? Now that's an interesting question, but you already know the answer. All you need to do is look deep inside yourself. Who are you? Do you remember dying? Switching from female, the voice belonging to the woman upstairs, to male. It seemed as though Lorcan was talking to himself. Another of the many things he wasn't able to understand. How could the voice change if everything was programmed to work the way it did? Was it something they were doing to him? Attempting to turn, to go back, Lorcan found himself trapped in place. Closing his eyes once more, he thought of the questions the voice asked. He'd asked, who was he? Did he remember dying? How could he remember dying when he was alive? Deeper than before, memories swirling around him, Lorcan saw himself as he was, long before he found himself in prison, the man below him was one of the men he'd killed, becoming a serial killer wanting to find a way to free himself. Only the man didn't look the way he had before. He looked like Lorcan. Lorcan killed Lorcan. It was the same for every memory. He saw things as they were, as they'd been, and how they were going to be. Within the prison, there were hundreds of Lorcans. Some were the prisoners, all of them arrested for one crime or another, placed together to pay for their bad choices. Others were the guards, watching over the other Lorcans. As Lorcan, the true Lorcan, tried to understand what he was seeing. Was the voice being controlled by something, trying to make him lose his sanity? So he'd spend the rest of his life, however short it would end up being, running through the darkness, never to find his way out. Insanity is an interesting theory, but no, my task is not to break you in that way. You are to know the truth, the whole truth, and make a decision as you were the next to walk these paths, the next to find their way into the abyss. Do you remember why you created it? Do you understand who you are? Lorcan shook his head. It was obvious he didn't understand who he was, but he knew where to find the answers. If the voice was right, and maybe the voice was right, he breathed in deeply, trying to find his center. Another of the things his grandfather taught him when he was younger, Controlling his more negative emotions was important. Only then he'd lost his center with his grandfather. Finding it once more was the beginning. Going back to that lesson, Lorcan found himself looking at himself. His grandfather was him too. A hard thing to ignore, but he managed it. As he heard the right choice in his head rather than his own. Although, if he was honest with himself, his grandfather almost sounded like he would if he was many years older. Connecting with the control he'd lost, Lorcan opened his eyes, and it was as though he was able to see the truth for the first time in his life. 
He was in the middle of what looked to be some kind of nebula, alone like he'd always been, something slowly becoming more painful as the years passed by. Years, decades, centuries, millennia. Everything was the same way it had always been. Earth almost called to him, looking as it always had. Beautiful. Lush. Home to animals and nothing more. Going down to it, Lorcan walked through the trees, breathing in the air, and thought about what to do next. How was he going to change things for the better? Was it even possible? The animals didn't seem to fear him. One, a wolf, moved closer. It didn't have a name then, but Lorcan knew it as it had become, a dog. The kind of pet he'd once had when he was younger, until the time came when it left him too. The pain probably what ended up breaking him. Death was complicated in so many ways. Petting the wolf, Lorcan thought of what his future was going to hold. Nothing in the universe. He was alone, and would always be alone, unless he did something to change that future. It wasn't as though he couldn't. Leaving the wolf with one last scratch behind the ears, he delved deep into Earth. Going through the layers, deep enough it was likely never to be found. Lorcan started work. If it was, it needed to be a safe place for those who learnt the whole truth about who he was. Somewhere he could make the choice once more, if it was right to keep up with things as they were. Maybe the time would come when he'd bring an end to it all, but there was no way of knowing if it would happen, or when it would be, or who might make the choice in the end. Little by little, he created the ruin. The abyss. A hiding place for the truth. It wouldn't be easy to find, but those who did would learn everything. From the beginning to that moment, as they stood within the darkness, making a decision that might change everything, the very way he'd made a decision he knew would change everything for the best. Moving from the ruin to the surface once more, Lorcan started work on the next stage. Beings made from his consciousness, slowly dwindling himself down to nothing. And yet he was everything. He was everyone. Man, woman, child. Not the animals. They were something else entirely, but it didn't matter, because finally he felt like he'd made the right choice. As he had that thought, he let himself forget. Lorcan no longer knew who he was. He was simply another human. And from there came the billions who inhabited Earth, all of them part of the beginning. Unlike anyone else, he knew the whole truth about the world. Others had made the same journey, learnt the same truth, with none of them making the decision to return. The darkness was no longer impenetrable. Able to see the ruin, which was better called a maze, somewhere his selves would wander until they touched the truth, the suit becoming part of them in a way it hadn't been before. Breathing in deeply, Lorcan sat down on the stone. If he left the ruin, everything would fade away. Like before he'd be alone, but the worst part was that he'd know he was alone. Maybe he'd remember all the lives he'd lived, able to dwell in those memories, only it would never be the same as it was. Yet humans had done so much bad. The choice he'd made changed Earth in multiple ways, most of them terrible. And Lorcan knew if he headed back through the maze, gaining all those people as a part of him once more. Everything would be different. Earth would return to how it was before, a paradise. Was he truly willing to be selfish enough to let himself destroy a planet? Biting down on his lip, feeling the pain, he thought of all the lives he'd lived where he'd hurt in one way or another. Traumatized by those around him because they were traumatized themselves, it went down from one generation to the next. Lorcan's own life a reminder of that something that broke him. Others were broken in a similar way. Hence prison. Being sent down to the sarcophagus knowing he was likely to die, but death wasn't the worst possibility, and he'd never known. Never had a way to. The truth hidden in the very deepest depths of Earth. Something people were going to keep exploring. Another thing he could keep from happening if he made the decision to walk back. All it took was him walking back through the maze to find there was no one there. No one anywhere, alone. Closing his eyes, Lorcan thought of the good in the world. It existed, everywhere. He might not have been able to see it, his own pain that much stronger. But he was able to see it as he sat in the maze, the ruin, the abyss, the sarcophagus, and more than anything else, the truth. How did the others decide? Exactly the way you are. Those who come down here have found life to be the most complicated it could be. 
It's part of the reason you're the ones who need to make the choice. You're the ones who truly understand pain in a way those who are happy cannot. They aren't able to understand how bad things are at times. Yet as you have thought, there is also good. Pain was something Lorcan felt before, as he wandered the universe searching for someone to be with, to not be alone any longer. Millennia of hunting for that one thing, and in the end he found it, but it wasn't what he expected it to be. Instead, it was a world he was able to claim for his own, to build something, which wasn't perfect. Nothing could be perfect. He was fallible, so his creation was fallible. They make mistakes. Lorcan made mistakes, letting the pain get the better of him, and he wasn't the only one who did. Had it not been for the others, those who made bright choices, he might have made the decision to walk back through the maze to where she was waiting, only she wouldn't be there any longer. She'd be one of the first to become part of him again, along with the guards and anyone else in the facility. From there, it would be the rest of humanity, little by little, until he was the only one left. He wouldn't be Lorcan anymore. Instead, he'd be the Wanderer once more, with nothing. Earth would be able to return to how it was, and maybe it was the choice he should make for the planet, but he couldn't. Leaving would destroy him. Able to see it in a way he couldn't before, he saw how loneliness was slowly transforming him, and that was part of the reason there was both dark and light within the human race. How he might have become dark enough to destroy the entire universe, because it hadn't given him what he wanted, a companion. Someone to love, the way he'd come to love in so many different ways. Maybe he would destroy Earth by staying, but surely it was better to sacrifice one planet than it was to sacrifice them all. Lorcan's decision was made. He stayed sad in the ruins, the same way all the others had done before him, hundreds of them having made a similar choice. They chose the universe over Earth. They chose their own sanity over anything else. Yes, a selfish choice, and yet it was the logical one, the most logical one for everything. He thought back to the wolf, scratching ears, one animal giving him a moment of something he could never have imagined before. It was then he knew what he needed, in a way he hadn't before, so he took it. One day he might not need it, but that day hadn't yet come. I never thought the day would come where I would be looking at a corpse. No amount of alcohol could get me through this. Blood drained from the back of Erickson's neck, and if that was the only thing, this would be a normal murder scene by my father's book. It was the blood splatter across the frigid stone walls, the dark wood boxes, and clay molded pots that tickled an uneasy emotion through me. My name is Brian Miller, and my role in Belumia was to shepherd wrongdoers and investigate any nefarious activities for our leader, Ben Sawyer. Somebody killed Erickson, which was a shock in itself. But if there was one good thing that came out of this, it would be that Erickson was free of this place, this life. Even though this was my job, that didn't mean I wanted to see stuff like this. And it was a blessing that I never saw things like this up until now. But things have changed. Hey, Miller! Sawyer's voice boomed through the arid walls and echoed a fierce power through me like it did his parishioners. I turned around and looked at Sawyer, the leader of the Lumia, a stalwart man known for his strong leadership, but his sweeter tongue. Miller, what can you tell me? What happened? Sawyer asked. It was rare to see Sawyer shaken, so I must admit, I was more scared than he was. I rocked my head. It's exactly what it looks like, but I haven't figured out anything yet. Well, you better figure out something, Miller. This is the first time anyone has been murdered in over 32 years. 
Everybody's pulling me left, right, and center about it. It's crazy. I knew that all too well. Well, all I can say is I'm ill-prepared for this as much as you are right now. Sawyer's eyes speared through me and he frowned. Then we need to be prepared. Everybody's scared right now. I had to end my evening prayer early. Everything's a mess. So, Miller, I'm asking you, can you figure out what happened? Don't worry, Sawyer. I won't fail you. Just give me time over here. I just came out of the pantry. I'm still looking at everything. Whoever did this is not going anywhere. There's no way to run anyways. Sawyer shook his head and bit his fingernail. Yeah, you're right. I locked down the tunnels to make sure nobody's leaving this town. I'll give you two days from now. After that, life has to go on. There weren't as many towns as there were holes in the earth. Because that's what they were living in. Under the earth. Alright. If anything, I'll report back to you. Sawyer opened his mouth, but decided against it. Nodded his head and walked back to the center of the town. I got back to work in this tight little enclave Erickson had here. Erickson was one of the more obscure residents of Dulumia, but he had an important role. He was a watcher, and his role was to go to the surface. And so he was the only person given the privilege to watch over the surface world, to check the upper crest of Earth for radiation levels, and to gather materials for use. Anything he gathered would be cleaned of radiation to make sure that he didn't endanger anyone below. People like Erickson were usually popular, at least back in my father's days. In these times, people like Erickson were either considered poison or distrusted. I wonder what poison was worse. The radiation of the nuclear fallout that devastated the Earth 76 years ago or the imaginative minds of people in the deep caverns of various interconnected underground towns that held the last of civilization. The place of Erickson's death was unremarkable. It was nothing more than a storage inlet that they built here. Something about him dying here didn't settle well with me. From what I could see, it didn't seem like he fought back. I unzipped my bag and dusted off a collection kit of tools for homicides, something I never thought I would use. The only injuries were around the neck and parts of the right hand. The neck was likely where the killing blow was administered. Huge lacerations carved from the side to the top. On one of the hands were brutal looking bruises. Was that caused by him trying to block an attack? The murder weapon of choice was a blood-soaked cleaver knife. On it was a pattern that indicated the owner, the meat butcher of Dulumia. I photographed the body and collected some blood. My canvas throughout the community was not much better. The houses were carved into the wall, yet the people's voices couldn't be heard from the depths within. Most people didn't talk to Erickson, so of course, I didn't find out much about anything. I still expected to get some gossip though. We were a town under the earth, with a few tunnels leading to other towns, some of them less terrible than others. But everybody was close-knit, so secrets were hard to keep, and if they were, it was usually out of respect for someone. Erickson was dead, so he was free game. I got nothing from the residents, much to my disappointment. The meat butcher was a dead end as well. He told me that the cleaver knife was stolen. He reported it to me a year ago, which was embarrassing for me that I forgot that much and it wasn't like larceny was common. Dulumia was one of the more prosperous towns. People from other towns wanted to come here. Not that Sawyer would allow them. Resources were few, and even though we had our own underground farms, covering a quarter mile of land, using a mix of aeroponics and greenhouse pits, food and energy usage was tightly regulated. 
I walk into the restricted sections of Dulumia and past the large 50-foot transformers of the substations, carrying the transferred heat energy of the neighboring magma to its residence. My analysis of Erickson's office once I reached there was uninspiring, to say the least. Clean and organized, but there were a lot of books and papers stacked in a neat bunch. They were labeled with ink paint on reusable brown paper that was constantly remade by the recycling department. I could assume the recycling department didn't like him. With only two days given to me, there was no way I was going to go through all of that. So I checked for anything on the surface that seemed out of place. I hated coming to Sawyer without good news, for he never liked anything except results. He was a tough leader, just like his father, but it was the only reason why the Lumia was still standing. There are many underground towns built by the military secretly in case an apocalypse came knocking. Sadly, many of those towns are gone now. A lot of them devolve into tyranny, mindless violence, or debauchery. Over 15,000 humans went underground on that fateful day many decades ago, but only around 700 of us were left. So as much people had their complaints about Sawyer, we gave him his praise, for he kept us safe. The shadows of the overarching stone gateway passed over me as I got closer to the Temple of Agon. Those arches curved into the crude rock that was sprinkled with drawings of animals, once hunted by our ancestors. My breath hitched as it got hotter and my nose twitched to the perfumed air. People in loose overalls were replaced with dark colored robes rolling over their now hidden forms. They mourned their dead ones and wished for future prosperity in hushed prayers. Some were probably praying for safety. A murder occurred and the perpetrator had not been caught. People were going to look over their shoulders for a while and I had to do the same as well. I stepped out of the confusing shadows and soon got bathed in the bright midst of the temple's might. Sawyer traveled without hindrance as he stood over his servants. People, hear me. Do you feel this energy? We are the blessed ones. We survived. And do you know what that means? You are the chosen ones. You survive because God has chosen you to survive, to continue on on this earth. You are the ones that will save this earth and it's only a matter of time for all of you, for all of us. The crowd cheered back their scattered affirmations and praises. It was nothing more than a circular room of the cave with flickering fires burning the wood into oblivion. But in one corner of that room was a large rising precipice of rock reddened by narrow ravines of bubbling magma flowing underneath it and crystals deposited along its edge. A large human-like statue sat on that precipice, crafted by our hands, with a rising path leading to the tunnel in its chest. This was the image of Agon, and he sat quite comfortably, high and mighty, staring down upon his servants. And his servants were many. As the scattered crowd moved in reverence and caution, under his perceived sight. Agon was the god they served. He spread like wildfire throughout the confines of her new home and soon took over the lives of many people here. All other gods and religions were forgotten and I had to be an inquisitor. I would question people's loyalty and faith in their religion and Sawyer's leadership. It's not something I wanted to do and I'm not too proud of it. But according to Sawyer, it had to be done. The moment people had a choice, they would destroy the peace of others. At least that's what he said. But I never saw the other side, so I couldn't speak to that. It annoyed me, for I needed some sleep. Sawyer came to me as I ascended the rock. 
What have you found, Miller? Did you find a killer? I exhaled in frustration. <sighs> I found nothing much to speak on. I talked to the people that knew him. He was more reclusive during his last months, and his family mirrored that sentiment. The butcher's knife that was found was stolen, so it can't be the butcher. I still have to find a thief of that knife, but outside of that, nothing. Sawyer said, What if the butcher just reported it, but he was lying? Possible, but he has no motive. He chops meat and Erickson is a recluse. There's no connection. Sawyer groaned aloud. Hmm. <sighs> Makes sense. I cleared my throat. <clears> Regarding <throat> Erickson, according to the guards at the portal, he was exiting out of the town a lot. Like, a lot more. Sawyer said under his breath, I know. My eyes widened. You gave him permission to? I'm not familiar with his job, but I assume it would only be a limited amount of times he would be able to exit out of the town, right? Sawyer looked at me as if I said something stupid and replied, There's no limit. He goes out, he gets what I ask him to get, and he brings it to me. That's what he's supposed to do but he's never been one to want to go out there. And, if I can be frank, he didn't even want the duty, but he's the only one with the knowledge to do it. So, he had to. That was normal. There were very few humans left, so skills were taught from parents to children. It was the same for Sawyer and me. Sawyer's father was the leader before him, and my father was just like me. The Law of the Lumia. There had been three leaders of the Lumia, and our fathers overthrew the first one, making Ben Sawyer's father the second leader, with my father being his right hand. Even decades between our families, nothing much had changed, with Sawyer being the leader and me being his right hand, but that also brought up an interesting problem. I asked, He had no child. Who's going to be the next in line? Sawyer stared at me. I don't know yet, and it's important that we get somebody. Somebody that we can trust. Yes, I'm sure you'll figure it out. I already have. The person is standing right in front of me. I finally look within those eyes, and terror ripped through me like a wild beast at the prospect. What? No! I was never trained for that! You can be trained, and you know me, Miller. I trust you. I already knew that, but that was not the problem. In the role I had, I was respected, and though things were slow at times, there could be fun with the usual fight in the bars and frolics after one of Igon's numerous mandatory festivals. No one liked Erickson or anyone that did that role. To go outside is to go into the hands of the devil, as far as these people were concerned. Everybody was going to scorn me. So I said, I appreciate that, don't get me wrong. I respect the offer, but I don't want to do this. It took a lot out of me to even say that much, but I knew Sawyer. He was not a fan of the word, no. Sawyer stepped closer. I hesitated as his hand patted my shoulder before his fingers gripped, his nails piercing my skin. You're going to do this for me, Miller. My lips twitched and urged open but it was as if the force of gravity locked them shut. Sawyer smiled and turned his head. Just do it, okay? I trust you. You get that? Just like my father trusted your father. My mind whirled in contempt at this new development. I hated this, but it wasn't like I had much of a choice. But where I lacked choice, I had leverage. He trusted me after all. All right, I'll do it. But here's the deal. I want a gallon of beer per week, some extra food rations, and I can choose to come into Sunday Mass. I think that's fair, considering I'm risking my life to do this extra duty that you're giving me. Sawyer and I were smiling at each other, but I could feel the raging emotion he was hiding behind that smile. Okay, got it. Follow me, he said. 
Sawyer led me up the stairwell and into the heart of Agon. It was the first time I ever entered this part of Dolumia. Only Sawyer's priests and chosen ones ever followed Sawyer into the heart of their god. I guess I felt special somehow. We came into a deep incline, and a large room presented itself with painted banners of our ancestors in grand exploits such as battles and festivities. It was quieter than it was outside. The men walking around here were in deeper reverence, and their faces showed no fear. We were surrounded by candles glowing in hollow holes. We both stepped onto the platform, holding an eloquently dressed table with its burning incense and its rows of knives along the edge. Sawyer opened up a door at the back of the platform, and we went down a narrow hall. The priests followed. The further down we went, the more unnerving sounds I heard. It was a mix of rubber against the wet glass with intermittent knocking sounds like some bad drum solo. The skin off my back crawled with a sensation. I walked into a frightening place. Cages were all over the room, but it was the things inside, those pseudo-plastic cages, that shook my bones down to the marrow. I glanced around and saw beasts of magnificent size. It could be reasoned these beasts were around eight feet tall. I shuddered from the overpowering might of the beast's size. Its brown, rubbery skin slumped and rolled off the prominent bones around its neck. Those eyes were big, but its claws were bigger, within an ugly metal glove wrapping around it. As shocked as I was, stone frozen in fright, my mind was in overdrive. What was this thing? Why was it here? What is this place, really? All these questions rebounded in my head. When I found my voice, it could not be contained within the temple. What the hell is this? My yell reverberated throughout the monsters and made them more feral, for they screamed out in solidarity with me. It was nauseating hearing their contempt for us. Sawyer turned to me with a somber expression. What do you think? I was scared stiff and my legs were wobbling, but I couldn't tell him that. Instead, I asked, What evil work are you doing here? Sawyer pointed at the creatures. Those creatures have a city 10 miles away from here. Erickson was collecting their eggs. We would breed them here. The question that formed in my mind was how much of a problem Sawyer had with that. He said Erickson didn't want the job. I was sure about one thing right now. I didn't want the job either. A city? I asked. Sawyer gave me the lowdown, and it was a terrifying one. Those creatures weren't just animals from our past or mutated credits. They were aliens. Erickson documented seeing their spaceships and the habitations they had set up on Earth, of which there were many. A lot of the cities were interconnected and clustered around each other, but were usually built near rivers and hilly areas. These aliens were named Far Loggers, but it wasn't Erickson who named them. It was another person, and that was 50 years ago. These aliens have been around for a long time, and it was a secret held tight to the chest by the leaders of each town, or what was left of them. A lot of those towns were devoured by armed far loggers. Dulumia was safe, for it was far away from most far logger cities. Sawyer seemed self-impressed with himself when he was talking about them, but my emotions were not calm. The breeding of them here was for our defense. Sawyer and the other leaders wanted to find the weaknesses in the far logger's makeup. So, they were only here for experiments and analysis. I looked at them making their low cries at us. The timber of their cries made their violent bashes against the walls more unsettling. They wanted no friendship, that's for sure. All their eyes communicated to me was my eventual death. 
did my father know about this? <sighs> no. If he knew, I would have known. My father taught me everything I needed to learn. So learning about this now, after all these years, made the working relationship between Sawyer and I seem ungenuine. I spoke. You kept this? You and all your friends in your pretty little club kept this a secret and I wasn't told about this? Well, welcome to the club. You know now. Sawyer's hand waved in a reassuring gesture, like he was unfazed by my concerns. Even though you're not going to admit it to me, Brian Miller, I know you don't believe in our God. You pretend to pray when you close your eyes, but I can see it in your face. You don't want to be here every Sunday. It's only a formality for you. You believe in the truth. The facts you can see right in front of your face. I swallowed and held my tongue, but my eyes flicked around at his cloaked priests, standing proud in their deeds with Sawyer. I know you're not an idiot, Mr. Miller. Being complimented by Sawyer was a rare occurrence, and I should have been proud, but it carried a mocking tone, as if I should know better about my place. Sawyer continued, You can go outside and take a look for yourself, but you can look at them right now. Does that to you look like an opponent we can defeat? The sad reality of spending decades under the earth is that we've had to limit our progress. We had to sacrifice our land, civilization, the things that gave us our weapons, our power. The same power and weapons that we use to destroy ourselves are gone. We left them up there on that ruined land and settled down to a simpler life within the core of this planet. Our forefathers all had dreams of eventually returning to the surface and taking back what was theirs, but they were naive. The Farloggers destroyed them. My father and the smarter leaders made sure we stayed underground. If they don't know we're here, we can never die. I shook my migraine-infested head. What are you saying to me? It's over? The earth is theirs now? Sawyer shook his head. It was never ours to begin with. It belonged to Agon, and we spat on his gift to us. It was taken away from us, and now he has given it to a new set of servants that will probably do better. As much as I was no servant of their god, so it didn't matter, I knew deep down he was right. What could we do? Nothing, really. We've been here for so long, and we were still here, but we left the Earth's surface unoccupied. It was easy pickings, and we did not have the manpower, much less firepower, to take it back. No matter how much I didn't like it, this was going to have to be our home now. I exhaled my frustration. <sighs> so what do you expect me to do now? Watch. That's all you can do. It was a simple instruction, but something was nagging at me. Erickson's death, what would become a forgotten topic, brokered renewed interest in my mind. Sawyer walked off, but he only made it a few steps before stopping and turning around to smile. Oh, and one more thing, Brian. When you go to the surface, don't go too far out there. You hear? Sawyer said. My tongue struggled to form the words, so I nodded my head in response. Learning the job wasn't as hard as I thought it would be. It was similar to the safety precautions when I passed the magnetic shield to enter the infirmary, only multiplied by ten. The rules were tighter, of course, and unlike my first job where I was dealing with humans, I was dealing with nature. The first day I stepped outside in the protective suit afforded to me, there was a sense of calm that came with knowing that I was on the surface of our planet. A place we once ruled. It was a place we ran from and couldn't go back to for fear of its dangers. Once Sawyer sent me out to their city on a collection raid, I got my chance to see what the city was like. I've only heard of the cities our ancestors used to build. 
But this was ridiculous. The Farlogger city was so vast, it was like they weren't strangers to our planet. The pristine walls reached the heavens. Buildings were composed of round blocks stacked upon each other. The glittering lights from the roots to the peaks gave it a fascinating shine over the darker shadows gripping the inner layers of the cityscape. My eyes were dazzled by the thousands of flying vehicles traveling over their city. Stealing the eggs was not easy, for the Farloggers became privy to us stealing their eggs. Erickson's notes helped inform me, so I was prepared. I was able to get one, but I didn't walk away unscathed. My ankle was sprained from running through the deep ravines Erickson illustrated in his notes. On my way back, I couldn't help but feel like a nuisance, like one of those other animals within the woods. Was that how they looked at me? Outside of those raids, it was a relatively boring job, and it took up a lot of my workload, so many months passed. Erickson didn't become a feigning memory to me, and even in the quietest of whispers within the Lumia, everybody was asking who they could trust. I went about my duties, keeping rule breakers in line and watching the surrounding land above the Lumia. Erickson's office became my refuge. His stacked notes and reports were an interesting subject matter for me. He kept a history of everything, and these documents were more of a diary rather than flat reports. When a person has time, I guess they could write all day, but these ramblings weren't about the Farloggers. It was about Sawyer. Erickson kept track of Sawyer's experiments and his actions. Sawyer wasn't honest with me as I thought. According to Erickson, those creatures were being bred for combat. Sawyer invested a lot of effort in trying to find ways to control them. These bastards lied to me. It was obvious he didn't want anyone to find out that part, and Erickson knew. It became clear to me who killed Erickson and why I was chosen to be the Watcher. What I needed right now was proof, or at least an honest answer. He did trust me after all. I came to Sawyer and asked, I want to speak to you, alone. Sawyer snapped his finger and the priests cleared the room. He motioned for me to sit, but I wasn't in the mood for that. This wasn't going to be a comfortable discussion anyway. I asked, Why did you kill Erickson? Sawyer's eyes shifted away from me and onto the roof. He loved being outside too much. He forgot his loyalty to us. Loved? I said in a hoarse whisper. We feared he was going to reveal the secret, so we had to take him out. And then you friend the butcher? Sawyer got up and went over to the offering table. We framed him. Help me out here, Brian. We have to protect the rest of the residents of the Lumia. From what? I asked. Sawyer touched one of the knives. Their selves. We as humans must be controlled, lest we destroy ourselves. I replied. We? <laughs> no. This is all about you gaining more control. You're right. He went around the table with his hands, clasped behind his back, but my heart pounded when my gaze settled on the knives. And with that control, I kept all of you safe. Your father did that, and now you're disrupting that peace. Sawyer stopped moving. You don't understand. If I get eternal peace... I'll disrupt it for even a second. He pulled a knife, but I pulled my gun, and he froze when I pointed it at him. Put it down. Sawyer's hand opened, and the knife clattered against the ground. He swiftly turned on his heel and ran into the back. I chased him and lost him in the darkness, but where my sight failed, my ears did not. A long beeping sound echoed. The resounding clanks of the cages shook my constitution, but my fingers gripped my gun tighter and my legs urged me forward with each step. What light was afforded to me 
showed their morphing figures flying across the room, but they never looked at me. Sawyer bellowed as they ripped into him with furious swipes of their claws. They had caught him before he ran away and laid their judgment upon him. Lights burned over me as they came on. It was a sickening sight. Sawyer choked as blood rippled up from his twitching lips. He was dead, but I was the last living human in this room. The far loggers turned around and glared at me. Every bone in my body screamed for me to run, but I was frozen. My eyes glanced around to see far loggers sneaking up behind me. I was surrounded. Sweat came down my face as I contemplated my next options, but my chest collapsed into an uncontrollable despair. I inhaled. Dying here was not an option. Sawyer! One of the priests called. The far loggers behind me immediately rushed that priest, attacking him. And that was my chance. Spinning on my toes, I jumped into a sprint toward the exit. My knee caught something and I tumbled through the exit. Rolling to a painful stop, I groaned in annoyance, but remembered my resolve, so I threw myself up to shut the door. Thuds and raucous bellows followed the shutting of the door. Even if it was made of thick metal, hearing their maddening distress to escape was enough to send my stomach into the pits. I hated to admit it, but Sawyer was right. We had to hide under the earth, but he just wasn't the leader to carry us into that future. My back was stretched when I got up, and his priests were glaring at me like I had been unfaithful with their wives. I passed their ugly mugs and knew if they dared touch me, I would shoot them. The far logger's cries echoed throughout the cavern, and when I stepped out, it was to the silence of Sawyer's flock. The whole town. All of them stared up at me, their eyes glowing through me, deeper than the razor. Whether they believed my explanation didn't matter to me. I just wanted to drink a beer that we could talk about why their home wasn't their salvation, but their punishment. The Dark Cosmos presents The Last Evolution, written by John W. Campbell, Jr. This classic sci-fi tale was first published in August of 1932. What will the final evolution be, and will we recognize it when it arrives? A thought-provoking story on the ultimate destination of all life. Sit back, relax, and unwind for the next several minutes as we delve way, way, way into the future in the year 2538, where we reach the end of mankind and the survivors of man's mind machine intelligence. Are you ready? As you immerse yourself in the story, always remember to stay cosmic. Let's begin. I am the last of my type existing today in all the solar system. I too am the last existing who, in memory, sees the struggle for this system. And in memory, I am still close to the center of rulers. For mine was the ruling type then. But I will pass soon, and with me will pass the last of my kind, a poor, inefficient type, but yet the creators of those who are now, and will be, long after I pass forever. So I am setting down my record on the mentor type. It was 2538 years after the year of the Son of Man. For six centuries, mankind had been developing machines. The ear apparatus was discovered as early as 700 years before. The eye came later, the brain came much later. But by 2500, the machines had been developed to think and act and work with perfect independence. Man lived on the products of the machine, and the machines lived to themselves very happily and contentedly. Machines are designed to help and cooperate. It was easy to do the simple duties they needed to do that men might live well, and men had created them. Most of mankind were quite useless, for they lived in a world where no productive work was necessary, but games, athletic contests, adventure, these were the things they sought for their pleasure. 
Some of the poorer types of man gave themselves up wholly to pleasure and idleness and to emotions. But man was a sturdy race, which had fought for existence through a million years, and the training of a million years does not slough quickly from any form of life, so their energies were bent to mock battles now, since real ones no longer existed. Up to the year 2100, the numbers of mankind had increased rapidly and continuously, but from that time on, there was a steady decrease. By 2500, their number was a scant two millions, out of a population that once totaled many hundreds of millions, and was close to ten billions in 2100. Some few of these remaining two millions devoted themselves to the adventure of discovery and exploration of places unseen, of other worlds and other planets. But fewer still devoted themselves to the highest adventure, the unseen places of the mind. Machines, with their irrefutable logic, their cold preciseness of figures, their tireless, utterly exact observation, their absolute knowledge of mathematics. They could elaborate any idea, however simple its beginning, and reach the conclusion. From any three facts, they even then could have built in mind all the universe. Machines had imagination of the ideal sort, they had the ability to construct a necessary future result from a present fact. But man had imagination of a different kind. Theirs was the illogical, brilliant imagination that sees the future result vaguely, without knowing the why nor the how, and imagination that outstrips the machine in its preciseness. Man might reach the conclusion more swiftly, but the machine always reached the conclusion eventually, and it was always the correct conclusion. By leaps and bounds, man advanced. By steady, irresistible steps, the machine marched forward. Together, man and the machine were striding through science irresistibly. Then came the outsiders. Whence they came, neither machine nor man ever learned, save only that they came from beyond the outermost planet, from some other sun. Sirius, Alpha Centauri, perhaps. First, a thin scout line of a hundred great ships, mighty torpedoes of the void a thousand kilad. In length they came, and one machine returning from Mars to Earth was instrumental in its first discovery. The transport machine's brain ceased to radiate its sensations, and the control in old Chicago knew immediately that some unperceived body had destroyed it. An investigation machine was instantly dispatched from Deimos, and it maintained an acceleration of 1,000 units. They sighted ten huge ships, one of which was already grappling the smaller transport machine. The entire foresection had been blasted away. The investigation machine, scarcely three inches in diameter, crept into the shattered hull and investigated. It was quickly evident that the damage was caused by a fusing ray. Strange life forms were crawling about the ship, protected by flexible, transparent suits. Their bodies were short and squat, four-limbed and evidently powerful. They, like insects, were equipped with a thick, durable exoskeleton, horny, brownish coating that covered arms and legs and head. Their eyes projected slightly, protected by horny, protruding walls, eyes that were capable of movement in every direction, and there were three of them set at equal distances apart. The tiny investigation machine hurled itself violently at one of the beings, crashing against the transparent covering, flexing it, and striking the being inside with terrific force. Hurled from his position, he fell end over end across the weightless ship, but despite the blow, he was not hurt. The investigator passed to the power room ahead of the outsiders, who were anxiously trying to learn the reason for their companion's plight. Directed by the center of rulers, the investigator sought the power room and relayed the control signals from the ruler's brains. The ship brain had been destroyed, but the controls were still readily workable. Quickly they were shot home, and the enormous plungers shut. A combination was arranged so that the machine, as well as the investigator and the outsiders, were destroyed. A second investigator, which had started when the plan was decided on, had now arrived. The outsider's ship nearest the transport machine had been badly damaged, and the investigator entered the broken side. 
The scenes were, of course, remembered by the memory minds back on Earth tuned with that of the investigator. The investigator flashed down corridors, searching quickly for the apparatus room. It was soon seen that with them the machine was practically unintelligent, very few machines of even slight intelligence being used. Then it became evident by the excited action of the men of the ship that the presence of the investigator had been detected. Perhaps it was the control impulses or the signal impulses it emitted. They searched for the tiny bit of metal and crystal for some time before they found it, and in the meantime it was plain that the power these outsiders used was not, as was ours of the time, the power of blasting atoms, but the greater power of disintegrating matter. The findings of this tiny investigating machine were very important. Finally, they succeeded in locating the investigator, and one of the outsiders appeared armed with a peculiar projector. A bluish beam snapped out, and the tiny machine went blank. The fleet was surrounded by thousands of the tiny machines by this time, and the outsiders were badly confused by their presence, as it became difficult to locate them in the confusion of signal impulses. However, they started at once for Earth. The science investigators had been present toward the last, and I am there now, in memory with my two friends, long since departed. They were the greatest human science investigators, Roll, 25374, and Trest, 35429. Roll had quickly assured us that these outsiders had come for invasion. There had been no wars on the planets before that time in the direct memory of the machines, and it was difficult that these who were conceived and built for cooperation, helpfulness utterly dependent on cooperation, unable to exist independently as were humans, that these life forms should care to destroy, merely that they might possess. It would have been easier to divide the works and the products, but life alone can understand life, so Roll was believed. From investigations, machines were prepared that were capable of producing considerable destruction. Torpedoes, being our principal weapon, were equipped with such atomic explosives as had been developed for blasting, a highly effective induction heat ray developed for furnaces being installed in some small machines made for the purpose in the few hours we had before the enemy reached Earth. In common with all life forms, they were able to withstand only very meagre Earth acceleration. A range of perhaps four units was their limit, and it took several hours to reach the planet. I still believe the reception was a warm one. Our machines met them beyond the orbit of Luna, and the directed torpedoes sailed at the hundred great ships. They were thrown aside by a magnetic field surrounding the ship, but were redirected instantly and continued to approach. However, some beams reached out and destroyed them by instant volatilization but they attacked at such numbers that fully half the fleet was destroyed by their explosions before the induction beam fleet arrived. These beams were, to our amazement, quite useless, being instantly absorbed by a force screen, and the remaining ships sailed on undisturbed, our torpedoes being exhausted. Several investigator machines sent out for the purpose soon discovered the secret of the force screen, and while being destroyed, were able to send back signals up to the moment of annihilation. A few investigators thrown into the heat beam of the enemy reported it identical with ours, explaining why they had been prepared for this form of attack. Signals were being radiated from the remaining fifty along a beam. Several investigators were sent along these beams, speeding back at great acceleration. Then the enemy reached Earth. Instantly, they settled over the Colorado settlement, the Sahara colony, and the Gobi colony. Enormous, diffused beams were set to work, and we saw, through the machine screens, that all humans within these ranges were being killed instantly by the faintly greenish beams. Despite the fact that any life form killed normally can be revived, unless affected by dissolution common to living tissue, these could not be brought to life again. The important cell communication channels, nerves, had been literally burned out. The complicated system of nerves, called the brain, situated in the uppermost extremity of the human life form, had been utterly destroyed. Every form of life, microscopic, even submicroscopic, 
was annihilated. Trees, grass, every living thing was gone from that territory. Only the machines remained, for they, working entirely without the vital chemical forces necessary to life, were uninjured. But neither plant nor animal was left. The pale green rays swept on. In an hour, three more colonies of humans had been destroyed. Then the torpedoes that the machines were turning out again came into action. Almost desperately, the machines drove them at the outsiders in defense of their masters and creators, mankind. The last of the outsiders was down, the last ship a crumpled wreck. Now the machines began to study them, and never could humans have studied them as the machines did. Scores of great transports arrived, carrying swiftly the slower-moving science investigators. From them came the machine investigators and human investigators. Tiny investigator spheres wormed their way where none others could reach, and silently the science investigators watched. Hour after hour they sat, watching the flashing, changing screens, calling each other's attention to this or that. In an incredibly short time, the bodies of the outsiders began to decay, and the humans were forced to demand their removal. The machines were unaffected by them, but the rapid change told them why it was that so thorough an execution was necessary. The foreign bacteria were already at work on totally unresisting tissue. It was Roll who sent the first thoughts among the gathered men. It is evident, he began, that the machines must defend man. Man is defenseless. He is destroyed by these beams, while the machines are unharmed, uninterrupted. Life, cruel life, has shown its tendencies. They have come here to take over these planets, and have started out with the first natural moves of any invading life form. They are destroying the life the intelligent life particularly, that is here now. He gave vent to that little chuckle, which is the human sign of amusement and pleasure. They are destroying the intelligent life, and leaving untouched that which is necessarily their deadliest enemy, the machines. You, machines, are far more intelligent than we even now, and capable of changing overnight, capable of infinite adaptation to circumstance. You live as readily on Pluto as on Mercury or Earth. Any place is a home world to you. You can adapt yourselves to any condition. And, most dangerous to them, you can do it instantly. You are their most deadly enemies, and they realize it. They have no intelligent machines. Probably they can conceive of none. When you attack them, they merely say, the life form of Earth is sending out controlled machines. We will find good machines we can use. They do not conceive that those machines which they hope to use are attacking them. Attack, therefore. We can readily solve the hidden secret of their force screen. He was interrupted. One of the newest science machines was speaking. The secret of the force screen is simple. A small ray machine, which had landed near, rose into the air at the command of the scientist machine, X5638 it was, and trained upon it the deadly induction beam. Already, with his parts, X5638 had constructed the defensive apparatus, for the ray fell harmless from his screen. Very good, said Roll softly. It is done, and therein lies their danger. Already it is done. Man is a poor thing, unable to change himself in a period of less than thousands of years. Already you have changed yourself. I noticed your weaving tentacles and your force beams. You transmuted elements of soil for it? Correct, replied X5638, but still we are helpless. We have not the power to combat their machines. They use the ultimate energy known to exist for 600 years and still untapped by us. Our screens cannot be so powerful, our beams so effective. What of that? asked Roll. Their generators were automatically destroyed with the capture of the ship, replied X6349. As you know, we know nothing of their system. Then we must find it for ourselves, replied Trest. The life beams? asked Kash 2, 56799, one of the man-rulers. They affect chemical action, retarding it greatly in exothermic actions, speeding greatly endothermic actions, 
answered X6221, the greatest of the chemist investigators. The system we do not know. Their minds cannot be read. They cannot be restored to life, so we cannot learn from them. Man is doomed if these beams cannot be stopped, said CR21, present chief of the machine rulers, in the vibrationally correct, emotionless tones of all the race of machines. Let us concentrate on the two problems of stopping the beams and the ultimate energy till the reinforcements, still several days away, can arrive. For the investigators had sent back this saddening news. A force of nearly 10,000 great ships was still to come. In the great laboratories, the scientists reassembled. There, they fell to work in two small and one large group. One small group investigated the secret of the ultimate energy of annihilation of matter under roll. Another investigated the beams under trest. But under the direction of MX 3401, nearly all the machines worked on a single great plan. The usual driving and lifting units were there, but a vastly greater dome case, far more powerful energy generators, far greater force beam controls were used, and more tentacles were built on the framework. Then all worked, and gradually, in the great dome case, there were stacked the memory units of the new type, and into these fed all the sensation ideas of all the science machines, till nearly a tenth of them were used. Countless billions of different factors on which to work, countless trillions of facts to combine and recombine in the extrapolation that is imagination. Then, a widely different type of thought combine, and a greater sense receptor. It was a new brain machine, new for it was totally different, working with all the vast knowledge accumulated in six centuries of intelligent research by man and a century of research by man and machine. No one branch but all physics, all chemistry, all life knowledge, all science was in it. A day, and it was finished. Slowly, the rhythm of thought was increased till the slight quiver of consciousness was reached. Then came the beating drum of intelligence, the radiation of its yet uncontrolled thoughts. Quickly, as the strings of its infinite knowledge combined, the radiation ceased. It gazed about it, and all things were familiar in its memory. Roll was lying quietly on a couch. He was thinking deeply, and yet not with the logical trains of thought that machines must follow. Roll, your thoughts, called F1, the new machine. Roll sat up. Ah, you have gained consciousness. I have. You thought of hydrogen. Your thoughts ran swiftly and illogically, it seemed, but I followed slowly, and find you were right. Hydrogen is the start. What is your thought? Roll's eyes dreamed. In human eyes there was always the expression of thought that machines never show. Hydrogen, an atom in space, but a single proton, but a single electron each indestructible, each mutually destroying, yet never do they collide. Never in all science, when even electrons bombard atoms with the awful expelling force of the exploding atom behind them, never do they reach the proton to touch and annihilate it. Yet, the proton is positive and attracts the electron's negative charge. A hydrogen atom, its electron far from the proton falls in, and from it there goes a flash of radiation and the electron is nearer to the proton in a new orbit. Another flash. It is nearer. Always falling nearer, and only constant force will keep it from falling to that one state. Then, for some reason, no more does it drop. Blocked, held by some imponderable yet impenetrable wall. What is that wall? Why? Electric force curves space. As the two come nearer, the forces become terrific. Nearer they are, more terrific. Perhaps if it passed within that forbidden territory, the proton and the electron curve space beyond all bounds and are in a new space. Roll's soft voice dropped to nothing and his eyes dreamed. F, one hummed softly in its new-made mechanism. Far ahead of us, there is a step that no logic can justly ascend, but yet, working backwards, it is perfect. F, one floated motionless on its anti-gravity drive. Suddenly, force shafts gleamed out, 
Tentacles became writhing masses of rubber-covered metal, weaving in some infinite pattern, weaving in flashing speed, while the whir of air sucked into a transmutation field, whined and howled about the writhing mass. Fierce beams of force drove and pushed at a rapidly materializing something, while the hum of the powerful generators within the shining cylinder of F1 waxed and waned. Flashes of fierce flame, sudden crashing arcs that glowed and snapped in the steady light of the laboratory, and glimpses of white-hot metal supported on beams of force. The sputter of welding, the whine of transmuted air, and the hum of powerful generators, blasting atoms were there, all combined to a weird symphony of light and dark, of sound and quiet. About F1 were clustered floating tiers of science machines, watching steadily. The tentacles writhed once more, straightened and rolled back. The whine of generators softened to a sigh, and but three beams of force held the structure of glowing bluish metal. It was a small thing, scarcely half the size of roll. From it curled three thin tentacles of the same bluish metal. Suddenly, the generators within F1 seemed to roar into life. An enormous aura of white light surrounded the small torpedo of metal, and it was shot through with crackling streamers of blue lightning. Lightning cracked and roared from F1 to the ground near him, and to one machine which had come too close. Suddenly, there was a dull snap, and F1 fell heavily to the floor, and beside him fell the fused, distorted mass of metal that had been a science machine. But before them, the small torpedo still floated, held now on its own power. From it came waves of thought, the waves that man and machine alike could understand. One has destroyed his generators. They can be repaired. His rhythm can be re-established. It is not worth it. My type is better. F1 has done his work. See. From the floating machine there broke a stream of brilliant light that floated like some cloud of luminescence down a straight channel. It flooded F1, and as it touched it, F1 seemed to flow into it and float back along it in atomic sections. In seconds the mass of metal was gone. It is impossible to use that more rapidly, however, lest the matter disintegrate instantly to energy. The ultimate energy which is in me is generated. F1 has done its work, and the memory stacks that he has put in me are electronic, not atomic, as they are in you, nor molecular as in man. The capacity of mine are unlimited. Already they hold all memories of all the things each of you has done, known and seen. I shall make others of my type. Again, that weird process began, but now there were no flashing tentacles. There was only the weird glow of forces that played with and laughed at matter and its futilely resisting electrons. Lurid flares of energy shot up. Now and again they played over the fighting, mingling, dancing forces. Then suddenly the whine of transmuted air died and again the forces strained. A small cylinder, smaller even than its creator, floated where the forces had danced. The problem has been solved, F2 asked Roll. It is done, Roll. The ultimate energy is at our disposal, replied F2. This, I have made, is not a scientist. It is a coordinator machine, a ruler. F2, only a part of the problem is solved. Half of half of the beams of death are not yet stopped. And we have the attack system, said the ruler machine. Force played from it, and on its sides appeared CRU1 in dully glowing golden light. Some life form, and we shall see, said F2. Minutes later, a life form investigator came with a small cage, which held a guinea pig. Forces played about the base of F2, and moments later came a pale green beam therefrom. It passed through the guinea pig, and the little animal fell dead. At least we have the beam. I can see no screen for this beam. I believe there is none. Let machines be made and attack that enemy life form. Machines can do things much more quickly and with fuller cooperation than man ever could. In a matter of hours, under the direction of CRU-1, they had built a great automatic machine on the clear bare surface of the rock. In hours more, thousands of the tiny, material-energy-driven machines were floating up and out.
Dawn was breaking again over Denver where this work had been done, when the main force of the enemy drew near Earth. It was a warm welcome they were to get, for nearly 10,000 of the tiny ships flew up and out from Earth to meet them, each a living thing unto itself, each willing and ready to sacrifice itself for the whole. 10,000 giant ships, shining dully in the radiance of a far-off blue-white sun, met 10,000 tiny darting moats, 10,000 tiny machine ships capable of maneuvering far more rapidly than the giants. Tremendous induction beams snapped out through the dark, star-flecked space to meet tremendous screens that threw them back and checked them. Then all the awful power of annihilating matter was thrown against them and titanic flaming screens reeled back under the force of the beams and the screens of the ships from outside flamed gradually violet, then blue, orange, red. The interference was getting broader and ever less effective. Their own beams were held back by the very screens that checked the enemy beams and not for the briefest instant could matter resist that terrible driving beam for F-1 had discovered a far more efficient release generator than had the outsiders. These tiny dancing moats that hung now so motionlessly grim beside some giant ship could generate all the power they themselves were capable of, and within them strange, horny-skinned men worked and slaved as they fed giant machines. Poor, inefficient giants. Gradually, these giants warmed, grew hotter, and the screen ship grew hotter as the overloaded generators warmed it. Billions of flaming horsepower flared into wasted energy, twisting space in its mad conflict. Gradually, the flaming orange of the screens was dying, and flecks and spots appeared so dully red that they seemed black. The greenish beams had been striving to kill the life that was in the machines, but it was life invulnerable to these beams. Powerful radio interference vainly attempted to stem imagined control, and still these intelligent machines clung grimly on. But there had not been quite 10,000 of the tiny machines, and some few free ships had turned to the help of their attacked sister ships. And one after another, the terrestrial machines were vanishing in puffs of incandescent vapor. Then, from one after another of the Earth ships, in quick succession, a new ray reached out. The ray of green radiance that killed all life forms, and ship after ship of that interstellar host was dead and lifeless. Dozens, till suddenly they ceased to feel those beams as a strange curtain of waving blankness spread out from the ships, and both induction beam and death beam alike turned as a side, each becoming useless. From the outsiders came beams, for now that their slowly created screen of blankness was up, they could work through it, while they remained shielded perfectly. Now it was the screens of the Earth machines that flamed in defense. As at the one command, they darted suddenly toward the ship each attacked, nearer, then the watchers from a distance saw them disappear, and the screens back on Earth went suddenly blank. Half an hour later... 9,633 titanic ships moved majestically on. They swept over Earth in a great line, a line that reached from pole to pole, and from each the pale green beams reached down, and all life beneath them was swept out of existence. In Denver, two humans watched the screens that showed the movement of the death and instant destruction. Ship after ship of the enemy was falling, as hundreds of the terrestrial machines concentrated all their enormous energies on its screen of blankness. I think, Roll, that this is the end, said Trest. The end of man. Roll's eyes were dreaming again. But not the end of evolution. The children of men still live. The machines will go on, not of man's flesh, but of a better flesh. A flesh that knows no sickness and no decay. A flesh that spends no thousands of years in advancing a step in its full evolution. But overnight, leaps ahead to new heights. Last night, we saw it leap ahead, as it discovered the secret that had baffled man for seven centuries, and me for one and a half. I have lived a century and a half, surely a good life, and a life a man of six centuries ago would have called full. We will go now. The beams will reach us in half an hour. 
Silently, the two watched the flickering screens. Roll turned as six large machines floated into the room, following F2. Roll, Trest. I was mistaken when I said no screen could stop that beam of death. They had the screen, I have found it too, but too late. These machines I have made myself. Two lives alone they can protect, for not even their power is sufficient for more. Perhaps, perhaps they may fail. The six machines ranged themselves about the two humans, and a deep-toned hum came from them. Gradually, a cloud of blankness grew, a cloud like some smoke that hung about them. Swiftly, it intensified. The beams will be here in another five minutes, said Trest quietly. The screen will be ready in two, answered F2. The cloudiness was solidifying, and now strangely it wavered and thinned as it spread out across, and like a growing canopy it arched over them. In two minutes it was a solid black dome that reached over them and curved down to the ground about them. Beyond it nothing was visible. Within only the screens glowed still, wired through the screen. The beams appeared, and swiftly they drew closer. They struck, and as Trest and Roll looked, the dome quivered and bellied inward under them. F2 was busy. A new machine was appearing under his lightning force beams. In moments more it was complete, and sending a strange violet beam upwards toward the roof. Outside, more of the green beams were concentrating on this one point of resistance. More. More. The violet beam spread across the canopy of blackness, supporting it against the pressing, driving rays of pale green. Then the gathering fleet was driven off, just as it seemed that that hopeless, futile curtain must break and admit a flood of destroying rays. Great ray projectors on the ground drove their terrible energies through the enemy curtains of blankness, as light illumines and disperses darkness. And then, when the fleet retired on all earth, the only life was under that dark shroud. We are alone, Trest, said Roll, alone now in all the system save for these, the children of men, the machines. Pity that men would not spread to other planets, he said softly. Why should they? Earth was the planet for which they were best fitted. We are alive, but is it worth it? Man is gone now, never to return. Life, too, for that matter, answered Trest. Perhaps it was ordained, perhaps that was the right way. Man has always been a parasite. Always he had to live on the works of others. First, he ate of the energy which plants had stored, then of the artificial foods his machines made for him. Man was always a makeshift. His life was always subject to disease and to permanent death. He was forever useless if he was but slightly injured, if but one part were destroyed. Perhaps this is a last evolution. Machines, man was the product of life, the best product of life, but he was afflicted with life's infirmities. Man built the machine, and evolution had probably reached the final stage. But truly, it is not, for the machine can evolve, change far more swiftly than life. The machine of the last evolution is far ahead, far from us still. It is the machine that is not of iron and beryllium and crystal, but of pure, living force. Life, chemical life, could be self-maintaining. It is a complete unit in itself, and could commence of itself. Chemicals might mix accidentally, but the complex mechanism of a machine, capable of continuing and making a duplicate of itself, as is F2 here, that could not happen by chance. So life began, and became intelligent, and built the machine which nature could not fashion by her controls of chance, and this day life has done its duty, and now nature, economically, has removed the parasite that would hold back the machines and divert their energies. Man is gone. And it is better, Trest, said Roll, dreaming again. And I think we had best go soon. We, your heirs, have fought hard, and with all our powers to aid you, last of men, and we fought to save your race. We have failed, and as you truly say, man and life have this day and forever gone from this system. The outsiders have no force, no weapon deadly to us, 
and we shall, from this time on, strive only to drive them out. And because we things of force and crystal and metal can think and change far more swiftly, they shall go, last of men. In your name, with the spirit of your race that has died out, we shall continue on through the unending ages, fulfilling the promise you saw and completing the dreams you dreamt. Your swift brains have leapt ahead of us, and now I go to fashion that which you hinted came from F2's thought apparatus. Out into the clear sunlight F2 went, passing through that black cloudiness, and on the twisted massed rocks he laid a plane of force that smoothed them, and on this plane of rock he built a machine which grew. It was a mighty power plant, a thing of colossal magnitude. Hour after hour his swift flying forces acted, and the thing grew, moulding under his thoughts, the deadly logic of the machine, inspired by the leaping intuition of man. The sun was far below the horizon when it was finished, and the glowing, arcing forces that had made and formed it were stopped. It loomed ponderous, dully gleaming in the faint light of a crescent moon and pinpoint stars. Nearly five hundred feet in height, a mighty, bluntly rounded dome at its top, the cylinder stood, covered over with smoothly gleaming metal, slightly luminescent in itself. Suddenly, a livid beam reached from F2, shot through the wall, and to some hidden inner mechanism, a beam of solid, livid flame that glowed in an almost material cylinder. There was a dull, drumming beat, a beat that rose and became a low-pitched hum. Then it quieted to a whisper. Power ready, came the signal of the small brain built into it. F2 took control of its energies and again forces played, but now they were the forces of the giant machine. The sky darkened with heavy clouds and a howling wind sprang up that screamed and tore at the tiny rounded hull that was F2. With difficulty, he held his position as the winds tore at him, shrieking in mad laughter, their tearing fingers dragging at him. The swirl and patter of driven rain came, great drops that tore at the rocks and at the metal. Great jagged tongues of nature's forces, the lightnings, came and jabbed at the awful volcano of erupting energy that was the center of all that storm. A tiny ball of white gleaming force that pulsated and moved, jerking about, jerking at the touch of lightnings, glowing, held immobile in the grasp of titanic force pools. For half an hour, the display of energies continued. Then, swiftly as it had come, it was gone, and only a small globe of white luminescence floated above the great hulking machine. F2 probed it, seeking within it with the reaching fingers of intelligence. His probing thoughts seemed baffled and turned aside, brushed away as inconsequential. His mind sent an order to the great machine that had made this tiny globe scarcely a foot in diameter. Then again he sought to reach the thing he had made. You of matter are inefficient, came at last. I can exist quite alone. A stabbing beam of blue-white light flashed out, but F2 was not there, and even as that beam reached out, an enormously greater beam of dull red reached out from the great power plant. The sphere leaped forward, the beam caught it, and it seemed to strain, while terrific flashing energy sprayed from it. It was shrinking swiftly. Its resistance fell, the arcing decreased, the beam became orange and finally green, then the sphere had vanished. F2 returned, and again the wind whined and howled, and the lightnings crashed while titanic forces worked and played. CRU-1 joined him, floated beside him, and now red glory of the sun was rising behind them, and the ruddy light drove through the clouds. The forces died, and the howling wind decreased, and now, from the black curtain, Roll and Trest appeared. Above the giant machine floated an irregular globe of golden light, a faint halo about it of deep violet. It floated motionless, a mere pool of pure force. Into the thought apparatus of each, man and machine alike, came the impulses, deep in tone, seeming of infinite power, 
held gently in check. Once you failed, F2, once you came near destroying all things, now you have planted the seed. I grow now. The sphere of golden light seemed to pulse, and a tiny ruby flame appeared within it that waxed and waned, and as it waxed, there shot through each of those watching beings a feeling of rushing, exhilarating power, the very vital force of well-being. Then it was over, and the golden sphere was twice its former size, easily three feet in diameter, and still that irregular, hazy aura of deep violet floated about it. Yes, I can deal with the outsiders, they who have killed and destroyed, that they might possess, but it is not necessary that we destroy. They shall return to their planet. And the golden sphere was gone, fast as light it vanished. Far in space, headed now for Mars, that they might destroy all life there, the golden sphere found the outsiders, a clustered fleet that swung slowly about its own center of gravity as it drove on. Within its ring was the golden sphere. Instantly, they swung their weapons upon it, showering it with all the rays and all the forces they knew. Unmoved, the golden sphere hung steady. Then its mighty intelligence spoke. Life form of greed, from another star you came, destroying forever the great race that created us, the beings of force and the beings of metal. Pure force am I. My intelligence is beyond your comprehension. My memory is engraved in the very space, the fabric of space of which I am a part. Mine is energy drawn from that same fabric. We, the heirs of man, alone are left. No man did you leave. Go now to your home planet, for see, your greatest ship, your flagship, is helpless before me. Forces grip the mighty ship, and as some fragile toy it twisted and bent, and yet was not hurt. In awful wonder, those outsiders saw the ship turned inside out, and yet it was whole, and no part damaged. They saw the ship restored, and its great screen of blankness out, protecting it from all known rays. The ship twisted, and what they knew were curves, yet were lines, and angles that were acute were somehow straight lines. Half mad with horror, they saw the sphere send out a beam of blue-white radiance, and it passed easily through that screen, and through the ship, and all energies within it were instantly locked. They could not be changed. It could be neither warmed nor cooled. What was open could not be shut, and what was shut could not be opened. All things were immovable and unchangeable for all time. Go, and do not return. The outsiders left, going out across the void, and they have not returned, though five great years have passed, being a period of approximately 125,000 of the lesser years, a measure no longer used, for it is very brief. And now I can say that that statement I made to Roll and Trest so very long ago is true, and what he said was true, for the last evolution has taken place, and things of pure force and pure intelligence in their countless millions are on those planets and in this system. And I, first of machines to use the ultimate energy of annihilating matter, am also the last. And this record being finished, it is to be given unto the forces of one of those force intelligences, and carried back through the past, and return to the earth of long ago. And so my task being done, I, F2, like Roll and Trest, shall follow the others of my kind into eternal oblivion, for my kind is now, and theirs was, poor and inefficient. Time has worn me, and oxidation attacked me, but they of force are eternal and omniscient. This I have treated as fictitious. Better so, for man is an animal to whom hope is as necessary as food and air, Yet this, which is made of excerpts from certain records on thin sheets of metal, is no fiction, and it seems I must so say. It seems now, when I know this that is to be, that it must be so, for machines are indeed better than man, whether being of metal or being of force. So, you who have read, believe as you will. Then think, and maybe, you will change your belief. Hey sci-fi horror fans, if you enjoyed this story, make sure to give it a thumbs up.
A special thanks to all our official channel members. Your support means a lot to us. Craving for another scary tale? Click that video on your screen. Until next time, everyone. And remember, stay cosmic.